So we're going to get started. And we're going to be talking about uh, uh, how we build our resiliency in the midst of all of the challenges that we're facing. How do we look at the sources of stress? How do we uh, look at the way that it's impacting us? And then what do we put in our kind of tool belt of tools to be able to manage that stress? You know, for many of us, we've been talking about this past year and you know, you've probably seen where it has been likened to being in the middle of a stormy sea and you're in this little wee tiny boat and you're being tossed all over the place. And the difficulty is, is because you can't see the shore. You can't get your bearings. You're not sure if you're even the only one that's being tossed around. Uh, and we're longing for that time when maybe we were on this kind of smooth sailing, you know, this lake where you could see the shore, where you could enjoy it. There may have been a few waves and ups and downs, but you were able to get your bearings and, and find your way. And I think for many of us, we, we may be longing for that, but that doesn't mean that we can't continue to move forward, even if it does stay a bit choppy for a while. So here is my very scientific uh, mental health scale. And so what I'd like you to do into the chat box is let me know how you're feeling on this particular Monday morning. I know it is Monday morning, it is early. So where do you think you would be on this mental health scale? So on my sheep scale. So in the chat box, let me know. Let me know kind of where you think you would be. Uh, you know, one, is it, are you bouncy? Are you got full of energy? Maybe it's a bad hair day, uh, you know, staticky, all that kind of stuff. But let me know as you kind of go through where you think you're, you are. So I'm seeing lots of fours and threes. Good. I'm seeing a seven, uh, some fives. So, you know, I've got a couple of people that are feeling a little sleepy still this morning. Uh, let's see. I've got some bad hair days going on right now because I know the whole, some people are holding themselves up. That's all right. Good. Five, sevens, threes. I got a two kind of full of some joy in there, laughing at things. Awesome. And I do have a couple of eights. So I'm glad to see that there are a couple of eights there as well. I use this. And again, this is not, um, you know, this is not uh, anything other than but for fun, but it does help to give us an idea of how people are feeling, how people are feeling when they come into our meetings, how they you know, are before we have to solve different issues. And I think it's important for our own mental health to be able to understand where we are throughout the day. We may start off with a ton of energy going, yeehaw, let's go. Or we may be one of those people that are, it takes a little while to get going. And so, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little sleepy. I don't have all my gumption. I'm not kind of ready to go. Uh, maybe something difficult happens, or maybe there's a family issue or a conflict that needs to be solved. And again, that can change how we're feeling about that particular day. So we're going to be looking at health. We're going to be talking about what are some of the resiliency traits that we know from our research? Uh, what are some of those strategies that we want to put into place that are going to help us to build that resiliency? And then following it up with the q and I do apologize. The breakout room feature is not working today for me. I, for whatever reason, um, Teams is not my normal platform. I'm using this because that's uh, something that uh, you use within the university. So again, I, I have no idea why, and that's OK. We'll figure it out as we go. So the first thing I want you to think about is what is health? What uh, definition comes to mind? What image comes to mind? What do you think of when you think of the word health? So in the chat box again, let me know what you think of. What kind of words or definition comes to mind when you think of the word health? Good, I'm seeing lots of balance come into place. Physical and mental well-being, thriving, awesome. Good, what else comes to mind when you think of the word health? For some of you, it may be uh, good. I'm seeing energy, I was gonna say energy. Um, there's definitely that mental and physical aspect to it. Uh, clarity, good. For some people, it may be energy, it may be nutrition, it may be going to see the doctor. You know, that, that image of health brings up all kinds of, uh, of thoughts. And so how do we take care of our own health? How do we implement health strategies? All of those things are going to be part of that. Uh, I like that wealth is going to be part of that. Good. All right. For me, one of the definitions, if I'm, uh, you know, all of those images come to mind when I think of health as well. But if I look at a definition of health, 
I really like the one that uh, comes from Dr. Wheel. And from him, he, what the, the, the essence of his definition is really about being able to live your life without feeling overwhelmed. Being able to do all of the things that you want to do, both with work and family and self-care, all of the different aspects, being able to do all of those things in the way that you want to do them without feeling like you are stressed out, overwhelmed, too much on your plate, being able to, you know, do them in a way that brings you that sense of satisfaction. And I like that definition because it's not necessarily about eating right. It's not necessarily about the absence of illness. It's about being able to do the things that you want to do in the way that you want to do them. So I want to talk a little bit about positive mental health. Now, positive mental health is, you know, a subset of this. And so what does that look like? And so for me, it's about, again, being able to do the things that you want to do. It's about being able to use your talents in the way that you want to use them. It's about being able to cope with the normal things that happen within your life. You know, those stressors, those challenges, those changes that we've been facing and doing it in a way that you are being productive, doing it in a way that allows you to be able to take those steps forward. Again, not getting overwhelmed in the responsibilities that you have. And so we can evaluate our mental health. We can evaluate where we are on that scale. Are we able to do the things? Are we feeling overwhelmed? Are we, you know, feeling like we're always behind? All right, so I want to change gears a little bit and I want to talk about resilience. And so what does resilience look like? Again, in the chat box, let me know what image comes to mind, what definition comes to mind. What do you think of when you think of the word resilience? Good, meditation, mindfulness, going with the flow. Perfect. Strength, I like that. Change and stress. Uh, not you know not getting overwhelmed by it perfect being able to bounce the ability to bounce bouncing without what's that one without breaking i like that bending without breaking that that uh, kind of image of the willow tree being being able to bend without snapping good being able to think things through good wow they're coming in fast uh, being adaptable good lots of adaptability in there being strong. I love those. Those are all great images. Uh, one of the ones, and again, many of you talked about this bouncing. And for me, that's the image that comes to mind. And for me, it is really about this, uh, you know, those hard rubber balls. How many of you played with those really tiny hard rubber balls when you were, uh, you know, in, in public school and you'd throw them up against the brick wall, like the one behind me, it would, and it would bounce everywhere and you would spend your recess with your friends, your buddies, you know, going out and chasing these balls all over the place. To me, that's resiliency. It doesn't matter how hard you hit the wall. It's about taking that energy, integrating that experience and moving forward, taking that next step. Now, you may not be on the same path that you thought you were going to be on. You know, you may be on a completely different, you know, path, bouncing all over the place. But that doesn't mean that it's the wrong path. It's about taking that energy and moving forward, taking that next step, not getting stuck in the emotions, not getting stuck in the chaos or the challenge, but being able to, in the face of all of that, be able to move yourself forward. And we talk about resiliency, not just for that particular moment, not just to get through this change or this challenge or this uh, crisis that we're in, but resiliency is about the whole picture. It's about being able to live a full and flourishing life. It's to be able to go through all of these changes, challenges, traumas that we're going through and to be able to come out on, you know, to, to come through them and to live a full and flourishing life, whatever that means, you know, particularly for you. Now, some of you like the science behind things. And so when we talk about different models, one of the models that I that I really like is the Robertson Cooper model. And you can actually go online and, and type in Robertson Cooper model and there is some assessments that you can take. And I like it because, first of all, it's simple. It looks at it's all of the different skills and puts them into four categories. And so are you living on purpose? Do you have a purpose? Do you have this overriding goal for how you want to live your life? Uh, do you have the confidence in your skills uh, to be able to take those next steps? Or do you have the confidence uh, that you have a purpose in the world? Again, kind of that connection back to that purpose. 
And then adaptability. You have this big picture, you have this vision, but you're able to take the next steps uh, and you're able to go with the flow. You're able to change directions. You're able to make the detours uh, on the way to be able to make those. So you have that sense of flexibility. And then the biggest one that we're seeing right now is around social support. It's that sense of being connected to friends, family, colleagues, to the greater community and, and allowing that to be able to ask for help, to be able to give help, to be able to um, use that as a protective factor. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about these as we move forward. All right, not seeing any other kind of comments or questions. Again, if you have them, just throw them into the chat box and I'll make sure I answer them as we go. So this next part is really around what are the traits? What are the traits that we see that build resiliency within people? And so it's everything from identifying stressors to self-care to making sure that you have supportive relationships, having that sense of a big picture, being able to manage your um, emotions and adjust accordingly to both the, the good and the fears that, that are happening. Uh, the way that you think is going to be part of your resiliency. So are you able to problem solve? Are you able to focus on the things that you need to focus on? Uh, are you continually learning and, and throwing tools into your tool belt? And then how do you look at the big picture? How do you have that sense of hope as you move forward? So let's delve into these one by one. The very first area that when we talk about resiliency is being able to identify where your stress comes from. And you have to be able to identify it and you have to be able to break it down into smaller pieces. You know, here's my guy Dirk. Dirk right now is on top of this roller coaster. And you're, if you're looking at this picture closely, you're going to see that Dirk is in these little wee ski boots. He is holding these little wee pools and he is on top of this wooden roller coaster ready to launch himself. And for many of us, this is what life has felt like this past year. It's that we're on this roller coaster. How many of you are looking at this picture and thinking, no way, not a chance? You know, some of you may be looking at it and going, yeehaw, let's go. Uh, some of you may be thinking, I, I might ride that roller coaster if they paid me enough. Some of you are thinking, you know what, if I sacrifice my friends and they live and they have fun, maybe then I'll go. In the chat box, let me know, where do you think you would be on this roller coaster ride? I'm seeing lots of no ways, not happening, no ways, not happening. If the price is right, I like that. Perfect, if the price is right. All right, no ways, no ways. I've got a couple thumbs up, interesting. Good. Again, certainly some people who are looking at taking the money. I look at these and, and you know, this is what life has felt like over this past year. You know, for some of us, we are excited. Look at all the things that we've learned. Look at all the, the ways that we've been able to manage and to cope and to pull together. And then there are those, you know, of us who are saying, I am tired. I want off this ride. Enough is enough. I want a little bit more calm. I want a little bit more predictability back into the way that we're doing things. And so you can see within your colleagues, within your family members, even on a day to day basis for yourself, there are days maybe you wake up on Monday morning, and you say, OK, I got this. And by Monday afternoon, you're saying, OK, enough. It already feels like a week has gone by. I want a break. And so recognizing that this is going to be part of our experience. But when it comes to identifying our stressors, you know, it's it's looking at the big things. It's looking at the little things. It's those things that are eating away at us. And it's also looking at, you know, the whole big picture. You know, if I was to look at that roller coaster, we could call that the Corona, ro the, you know, the Corona coaster, right? Um, because there is that sense of anxiety that many of us have been feeling. You know, that sense of anxiety from isolation, uh, that sense of anxiety from, you know, what's my what's my job going to look like or how are we going to make this happen or work or even at the beginning how am i going to work at home or you know I've, i i'm used to working at home but now i've got my family and my kids i don't i can't work with them around or now i have to do my job plus i have to be a teacher or <sighs> are we ever going to get out of this lockdown are we ever going to have it so that you know it's we're going to be able to get back to you know connecting and doing things and feeling safe even feeling safe just going to the grocery store. And so recognizing that it is impacting people's mental health. 
you know, 52% of us have said that our mental health is somewhat to much worse than it was prior to the pandemic. And so it is taking its toll. People are feeling worn out and burnt out. And for some of us, you know, we talk about this worrier kind of thing happening. And many of us have these thoughts, you know, on the outside, maybe in our meetings, uh, maybe in our social posts, uh, maybe when we're talking to family and friends, we're saying, oh, no, I got this. We're smiling on the outside. But on the inside, we're having these conversations of, you know, am I happy? Why can't I do anything right? Why is this happening to me? What do I really want? Uh, even little things of, you know, am I safe? Oh, why is that person coughing? You know, or, you know, back to, you know, simple things. How did I make that mistake? Why did I let this happen? And we have these conversations. We call these the, our, our monkey mind thoughts, right? You know, we have thousands upon thousands of thoughts a day and they go from, you know, this branch to this branch. A lot of the times it's about the past and it's about the future. You know, why did I make that mistake? Or am I going to be okay? And we find these racing thoughts that can keep us awake at night. They can prevent us from being in the moment. They take the joy out of things. Many of us are feeling kind of that we're going from place to place. And we have to figure out how do we calm this monkey mind? Because it's full of anxiety and worry and stress and anger and frustration. And it, like I said, it can zap the joy. So calming that monkey mind, being mindful, bringing yourself into the moment. Simple, Something really simple that can help you back into the moment is, you know, Get in touch with your five senses, taste, touch, sight, sound, smell, and really focusing in. What can I, what can I hear right now? Uh, you know, what can I smell? What can, you know, just we're coming into spring. And, and for me, I love the smells of spring, good and bad. Uh, but it's, you know, all of these different things that helps to bring me into the moment. What can I hear? I love, you know, just stepping outside and seeing if I can identify different bird calls. You know, so do, using some of those techniques, uh, even something as simple as saying, I'm safe, I'm healthy. I'm safe, I'm healthy, whatever your mantra is to bring you into that moment. All right, so the first part was, you know, talking about where it comes from. Part of the other experience is knowing what does it do to you. And, and when we put its strategies into place, we have to have strategies that are going to take care of the sources of stress, but we also have to be aware of that impact so that we can put strategies in place as well. So in the chat box, for, I'm going to get you to answer two questions. So let's start with the first question. Where in your body do you feel it when you get stressed out? So think about this. When you get anxious, when you get upset, when you get frustrated, when you get angry, when you get stressed, where in your body do you feel it? Where does it hit you? So I'm seeing lower back. I'm seeing necks and shoulders, chest, breathing, hard to take that deep breath. Good stomach, upset stomach, constipation, diarrhea. Hey, Pepto-Bismol commercials, right? Uh, that whole kind of dance that goes with it. Chest, that heaviness on the chest, feeling like it's hard to take that next breath. Maybe it's your heart pounding and beating. Necks and shoulders are a really common one. Everything tenses up, it tightens up, it locks up, it's sore. Joints could be another one where they ache, you know, things creak, they don't move in the same kind of way. Anybody for uh, sleep habits, you can't fall asleep, you can't stay asleep, you feel like you've dreamt the whole night through. Or anybody for your eating habits, um, you know, you go right to the, the comfort foods, the sugars, the salts. Good. Working your way, can't, yeah, can't get back to sleep. It wakes you up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back to sleep. Absolutely. Which does this one say? Oh, so much ice cream. Yeah, for me, it's Hagen dazs coffee flavored ice cream is a definite treat. Chocolate comfort almonds high on my list when I'm stressed out. Absolutely. I think it's really important to understand where in your body, where does it hit you? Uh, some of you, it might be the, the racing thoughts. Some of you, it may be different systems in your body uh, where you could, you know, it could be jaw clenching, grinding, could be twitching. 
Some of us, you know, it might be the, the eye that twitches when you get stressed out, all kinds of different things. But we need to be aware of where it hits us. All right, I think the second question, the better question is, how do other people know when you're stressed out? What does it look like to somebody else? What does it look like to your family members, your friends, your colleagues? How can they tell when you're stressed out? What does it look like? So in the chat box again, let me know what you think. What does it look like when you're stressed out? Snappy, absolutely. I see lots of snappy, grouchy, cranky, uh, sleeping a lot more. Yeah, a lot tired or quiet. Some of us get quieter, some of us get louder. Good, irritable. Let's see, lots of irritable. Sleeping, uh, shutting down, like I said, yeah, pulling away, isolating is going to be part of that. Any of you get uh, a little bit sarcastic? Um, you know, you get a kind of an edge to the way that you talk or you go right to the one word answers. It's like fine or whatever. Mood. Some of us get very moody, you know, we're up, we're down, we're all over the place. It's not predictable. I tend to get my patience goes out the door. You know, what was okay yesterday is now not okay today. And so, uh, you know, I, I tend to lack patience. Good. Let's see. Unresponsive. Yes, you know, sometimes it's that um, you're having a conversation with somebody and you can tell because they're not really paying attention. And it's not that they're trying not to pay attention. It's just that there's so much on their mind that they are distracted or they're glazed over. Uh, we can tell sometimes just by the, the responses that they give us, right? And so certainly we can see it and we can hear it in the way that people respond. Uh, yeah, a, a lot more negative in their responses too. We, we don't tend to be able to problem solve. We don't be able to, uh, maybe we're not collaborating in the same way. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, it's it's important to understand not only where in our body do we feel it, but how do we typically respond? I know for me, where is neck and shoulders? And how I typically respond is, you know, I do get much more impatient and I tend to get a lot louder. And so, you know, for me, it's about, I, I just, I explode. And then I need to, you know, kind of use that, I get rid of that emotional energy and then I can get into problem solving again. And so understanding that it's gonna be different for each person and understanding that, you know, we, we need this kind of insight to help us to figure out what resiliency strategies to put into place. I like this mental health continuum. This is actually the real mental health continuum. And uh, you, you can find this from the Canadian Mental Health Association or the Mental Health Commission of Canada. But I like it because not only does it kind of give you the categories of excelling all the way down to crisis, but it describes some of the behaviors and the feelings you know, are you energetic? Are you joyful? Are you cheerful? Are you connecting to the people around you? Uh, maybe you're more worried or nervous or on edge or distracted. Maybe you have muscle tension happening. Maybe you're in that kind of surviving mode, just getting through. Uh, maybe you are, you know, have these uh, outbursts and feeling that sense of hopelessness and helplessness. And maybe you're unable to do the things that you need to do and you're feeling extremely isolated. Again, maybe you're more in crisis. And so just kind of be aware of where you would be on this scale and, and how it flows and how it changes based on the kinds of things that you have to deal with and understanding what kinds of things can drag you down. Uh, and for some of us, it's gonna be the big things and some of us, it might be the little annoying things. I go back to really identifying where your stress comes from. All right, that's the where. That's knowing where it comes from, and that's knowing what it looks like. This next piece is really about how do we put some self-care strategies into place, and what does self-care really look like? What we know about 2021 is that it's gonna be all about getting back to the basics. You know, what gives us energy or what drags us down? So in the chat box, let me know what are the things that would be your biggest energy drainers? What are the, those things that suck the life energy from you? Good, so thinking about what are the energy drainers? What are those things that just, you can change your mood or pull you down or change the way that you see things? Again, I want you to think about at home and at work. Good, chaos, worrying about money. Absolutely money issues is gonna be that part of those drainers. 
other people's anger or anxiety can impact us. Absolutely. Uh, worrying. Good. Let's see. Uh, family illnesses. Chaos. Worrying about, uh, let's see. Uh, watching out for other people. Negativity. Other people's negativity has a huge impact. Good. Uh, deadlines are going to be part of that. Too many projects, too much to do, not enough time to do them. Again, wearing you down, feeling like you're never getting ahead. Back to back meetings. Absolutely. Not having that kind of thinking space, not having that uh, that space to be able to to you know get up and move around you know feeling like you're you're continually part of that uh, the emotions of others again uh, positive and negative you know if somebody's way up here and you're not again that can even drain your energy Have, you know being too connected to people other people's challenges such as family illnesses absolutely all right I want you to think about you know those are the drainers what are those things that boost your energy. And, you know, what are the, those things that as soon as you get involved in them, they actually give you that sense of energy. And I want to talk about a few of these. So let's look at some of them. Like I said, prior to 2020, you know, there were all kinds of resiliency strategies and, and all of them are great. There's not a problem with that. But when you're tired out and worn out, sometimes it's it's easy to let those things go. It's easy to feel like you don't have enough time or energy for them. And so what we know right now, and as we move through 2021, it's going to be about getting back to the basics. And I think for many of you, you can probably look back and go, yeah, you know what? I used to do this and I'm not doing that anymore. And I can feel it now. For the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things that I found is because my presentations all became virtual, I was spending a lot of time sitting. I was sitting at my desk and working and designing. And then I was sitting at my desk and I was delivering and so I felt like I, I was sitting all the time and I was letting go of my my exercise routine because I used to teach karate classes. I have my black belt and I loved getting you know together with the kids. That for me was fun, but it was also exercise. But we weren't doing that because we couldn't get into the schools to to uh, offer these classes. And so my body was aching. So now I give my presentation standing up and I try to, you know, get up and move around more than I did before. But it takes a whole lot more energy, a whole lot more thinking and planning. So getting back to the basics, basics are sleeping right, eating right, exercising. Yeah, we know this stuff, but how are we bringing that into our day to day? Uh, something as simple as um, have you let creep happen? Do you know what I mean by creep? Creep is where, well, I don't have to get ready for work, really. I'm just going to be, you know, moving from, you know, my bedroom to wherever my, my office is now set up, whether that's the kitchen or the living room, or maybe I have a dedicated space now. And it's only, you know, 20 steps, so I get there and, well, I don't, you know, because I don't have any commuting time, I might as well just start working. And I don't really have anything planned for the end of the day, so I'm just going to keep answering these emails. I'm going to keep continuing to, to work on these projects. And our day has gotten longer and longer. We might even be, you know, skipping out on breaks. I have nobody to really go for a break with, so I'm just going to keep on doing what I need to do. Uh, well, the kitchen's right there, so I'm just going to grab my food and come back and sit at my desk. You can give me kind of thumbs up if that sounds like you. You know, it's kind of happens that things just kind of keep getting built into this day. Uh, we don't have the same kind of transitions. We don't have the same kind of commute. And even if you were used to uh, working from home prior to all of this, like many of you were, um, the problem is the people around you are also not necessarily commuting. Uh, they're already there. And so there doesn't really seem to be a, a start and stop or a transition between kind of our work and taking care of ourselves or taking care of our families and connecting to the people around us. Are you drinking enough water? Uh, are you making sure that you're you know, moving your body? All of those things that we talked about. What are you doing for hobbies? What are you doing for fun? What are those things that just give you joy? Have you let go of those? How are you connecting to your friends? How are you connecting to your family? These are some of the things that are absolutely part of our, our energy management system. 
I absolutely, I love this. Uh, Laura's saying, I, I love not commuting. Yeah, you know what? I, I, it's a perfect because, you know, maybe you're not driving a half an hour or an hour, but have you filled it with more work or have you filled it with self-care time? Have you filled it with time to connect to your family and friends? I think, you know, some there are definitely some benefits. Are we using those benefits to our the best of our abilities? All right. Energy management is an interesting piece. And for many of us, you know, that lack of time get absolutely gets in a way. And so what I want you to think about is these micro practices. Thinking about what can I do if I have one minute? You know, somebody says, hey, I'm going to be a couple minutes late to the meeting and you end up having to wait for this person to come. What do you do? Do you fill it with more work? Do you wait impatiently and let yourself get angry or frustrated? Or do you have these micro practices, these things that you can do to take care of yourself, to give yourself back a rhythm to life? I look at some of these, you know, what are some of the one minute things that you can do? Maybe you've got five minutes. Maybe you've got 10 minutes. Somebody says, you know what? Um, can't make this work. We're going to have to reschedule. Uh, can we can we do this in, you know, 10 minutes from now? Or maybe I've got 30 minutes. 30 minutes that I wasn't planning on that now I can do something for myself. And so let's consider some of these five minute, one minute, 10 minute, maybe 30 minute opportunities. For me, you know, uh, because I've, I've got, I've, I've worked from home for over 20 years. And so for me, I have to really think about these one minute breaks because I tend to not drink enough water. I tend to not, you know, do my deep breathing strategies. And so I have to really connect these to something. I connect actually my deep breathing to checking my emails. You know, if I've got time to check emails, I can do my deep breathing at the same time. If somebody says they're going to be late, I get up, I go to the kitchen, I grab something to drink. I force myself to connect that those one minutes to those kinds of activities. Five minute types of activities. Maybe you can listen to your pump up song or your relaxation song. Uh, maybe you can get some things organized on your to do list and cross some things off and figure out what your next steps are. Ten minutes. I like ten minutes now. I love napping and I'm going to talk about napping a little bit further, but for me, 10 minute nap, not worthwhile. So I'm not going to put napping on there, but certainly I can get something to eat and I can get outside for 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, I can take both dogs out, make sure that they've gone to the bathroom, you know, kind of bask in the sun or the weather or whatever it's like and come back in ready to go. 30 minutes. I love 30 minutes. 30 minutes. I can watch a funny video. I can connect with my friends through Messenger. I can, you know, I can I can go for a quick walk. 30 minutes, simple, easy things to do. So in the chat box, let me know what some of your micro practices are. What are some of those things that you do that just give you energy? that you can fit in between meetings, that you can fit at the end of, you've accomplished something, you've got something marked off your to-do list. What is it that you can, you know, use as a way of celebrating? Uh, love, absolutely, meditation, good, stretching exercises, working it out of neck and shoulders and back, and we're gonna talk about that more. Good, getting some dinner prep done, perfect. So multitasking for some of those things. Uh, using your stepper, good. Let's see, sun salutation, I love that. Just, you know, getting out and being in the sunshine, feeling the warmth of the sun and just, you know, the sounds of nature. Good, uh, head downstairs to check on the dogs and make sure, you know, make sure they're okay. They're social creatures. They wanna know that, that uh, you're okay and you need to be able to see them as well. Awesome, all right. Uh, Actually, I'm going to go back just a second here. I want to talk a little bit more about these micro practices. A long time ago, we, when we were cavemen and cave women, we had a rhythm to life. So I want you to keep that in mind. We had a rhythm to life, and that rhythm to life was we got up in the morning, we went for a hunt, we killed the beast, we ate it for lunch, we had a nap. We had a rhythm. But for many of us, you know, we've lost that rhythm. We've lost, you know, dealing with a stressful situation and coming back down, dealing with the next stressful situation and coming down. 
You know, we get up in the morning, we've got too much to do. There's meeting after meeting. We don't even have time in between meetings to go to the bathroom. And then, oh my gosh, we'll have to get dinner ready. And, the, you know, I've got to take care of the kids. And, oh my gosh, uh, you know, there's so much to do. And then I got to go to sleep. And we've lost that rhythm. These micro practices, they don't do anything about the situation. What they do is they help to give you that rhythm back. They help to recharge that battery so that you can deal with the next stressful situation. So looking at ways of taking it from up here to down here. Awesome. Uh, let's see. What is that one? Duolingo. I have no idea what that is. Somebody want to tell me what that one is? The Duolingo. That was from Jennifer. Language lessons. Oh, okay. Got it. I love it. It's a, a language oh, learning app. Perfect. Yeah. You know, they say, um, you know, prior to COVID, that people could learn in a, an entire language in the time that it takes that we commute over a year. And so I think that's awesome. Real quick little lessons. Okay. There's a thumbs up for that one. Next on our list. Let's delve into some of these a little bit further. And so sleeping, you know, are we feeling sleep deprived? You know, prior to COVID, two thirds of us said we weren't getting a good night's sleep. We weren't able to fall asleep, stay asleep. Maybe we dreamt the whole night through, didn't feel like we were rested. Many more of us are starting to feel that way. You know, as it takes its toll, it's impacting our sleep. That worry keeps us up. We're not able to relax. We're not able to get into that deep sleep. And so sleeping is, you know, it's not a luxury. It is something that we absolutely have to focus on. It helps us to be able to take care of ourselves. And so how do you make sure that you're getting the right quality and the right quantity of sleep? I like this image that sleep washes our brain. When we understand the priority, it's a lot easier to put it into our schedule. You know, sometimes we sit down on the couch and, you know, we just want to relax at the end of the day and we find that hours have gone by. But is that the right bedtime routine for us? For some, absolutely. Doesn't matter what you do before bed, you can fall asleep anywhere, anytime you get a great sleep. But for people who have trouble, you know, getting a good quality sleep, what is the bedtime routine that you set yourself up with? You know, we do that for little kids, but for those of you that are parents, you know, it was really important to follow a bedtime routine. That's how they kind of wound themselves down. Uh, just because we got older doesn't necessarily mean that we don't still need that bedtime routine. So are you following a bedtime routine? Are you getting the right uh, quantity of sleep? You know, the, the research says that we need somewhere between seven and nine hours. And the last study I read said eight and three quarter hours per night. Interesting, eight and three quarter hours. I said I was going to talk a little bit about napping, and this is where this all ties in. A sleep cycle is 90 minutes long. You know, from the time that you go from lying down and you, you're kind of closing your eyes, getting into that, you know, light sleep, deep sleep, dream sleep, sleep cycle is about 90 minutes. A fantastic nap is 90 minutes long. For those of you that have tried to nap and say, well, I can't nap, it could be that you're trying to wake yourself up in the middle of a sleep cycle. You're going to feel groggy and edgy and, you know, you know, all of the kind of nasty kind of feelings of, around napping and you're going to feel like, well, that wasn't worthwhile. 20 minutes or less so that you don't get into that deep sleep or 90 minutes are, is the kind of the, the sweet spots that you're looking for when it comes to napping. Getting a good quantity of sleep and quality of sleep also requires that you have several of these sleep cycles throughout the night. And so are you, you know, six, seven and a half, nine hours? Now, I said eight and three quarter hours because when you put them back to back, you become a little bit more efficient. And so it's not quite nine full hours of sleep. But look at the way of how you get up in the morning. If you're fighting your alarm clock, maybe it's because you're trying to wake yourself up in, a, in the sleep cycle. If you have teenagers, absolutely look at where their sleep cycle is when they fall asleep and when they're trying to get up so that you're not trying to get them up in the middle of a sleep cycle. All right, uh, nutrition. So let's talk a little bit about this. What percentage of a Canadian, typical Canadian diet is made up of processed food? What do you think? And I'll narrow it down a little bit. I'll give you some options here. What do you think? 47, 23, 62, 71. What percentage of our you know, daily diet is made up of processed foods? 
So I'm seeing 62, 62, 71s. Let's see, some 71, 62s, lots of 62s. Good. Doesn't look to be any kind of A's and C's so far. No A's and C's, lots of 72s, 61s, oh, 123 in there. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna narrow this down a little bit. It's not 47 and it's not 23. Seem to be kind of heavy on this on the uh, the 62, and it is 62. 62% of our, our daily diet is made up of processed foods. Now, that doesn't mean that processed foods are bad. It just means that we need to be careful what kinds of processed foods we're, we're, you know, we're selecting. Is it the kind of food that is giving us energy, or is it the kind of food that is sucking the life energy from us? So, good question. You know, for some of us, you know, this is us walking down the chip aisle, you know, grabbing all of the food and throwing it into the grocery cart. Anybody know what G-I-G-O stands for? You probably have heard this before. G-I-G-O stands for garbage in equals garbage out. Absolutely. Thank you. Some of you got that. You know, I think when we are going through very stressful situations or there's a lot of change and challenge, it's really important that we start to make good food choices. This for me is one of the hardest ones. Like I said, I tend to not make good food choices. I spend the entire day you know, by myself. My husband works away from home. My uh, youngest one is in university, but he also works full time. So even though he's doing his classes from home, he doesn't really spend a lot of time there. And, and so during the day, eh, just I'll grab whatever's close and handy. I have to really start to focus. I, you know, if I look at what my next couple of months, uh, if I want to work on something, it's going to be around making better food choices. And I have to figure out how to do that because I've done the whole, let's buy only good food, but my cravings eat away at me. And I know eventually they go away, but they're distracting, not necessarily fun. So I need to find fun ways of getting the right kinds of foods. Again, whatever your challenge may be, uh, for me, I know I need, I can't get rid of chocolate completely. I have to add a little bit into my diet, but not so much that it's taking over my choices because I don't feel as good. I don't feel like I have the same kind of energy than when I'm making the right kind of choices. All right, simple question. What is the absolute easiest way to break your stress response? Let me know in the chat. What is the easiest way to break your stress response? What do you think? Taking a deep breath, good. Deep breathing, excellent. What else is in here? The absolute easiest way to break your stress response. Any thoughts? Drinking water, great. All right. Hmm. Deep breathing. Now we know this. It's the it's the way that um, it's the absolute opposite of when we're stressed out. By doing deep breathing, it can actually counterbalance all of the negativity from our stress response. And so, how do we build this deep breathing into our our daily routine? Now, what we know is that many of us only use the top third of our lungs when we breathe and when we get stressed out that becomes even smaller and so we need to find ways of being able to expand our lung capacity so wherever you're at i want you to sit up nice and tall uh, whether you're standing or sitting body nice and tall if you're standing feet or shoulder width apart knees are slightly bent uh, if you're standing or sitting relax so shoulders arms hanging comfortably down at your side for a moment we're going to breathe in three parts. I want you to be able to fill the, the bottom part of your lungs, fill the middle part of your lungs, fill the top part of your lungs. And then we're going to release in the opposite order. We're going to release the top, release the middle, release the bottom. We're going to go in through our nose and out through our nose. Now, you may have done either yoga or meditation. There's all types of breathing strategies out there. This is the easiest one for us to do and the easiest one for us to teach. So 
All you're going to do is you take one hand and you're going to put it underneath your belly button. You're going to take the other hand and you're going to put it above your belly button. So I want you to be able to feel yourself filling the bottom, the middle, and the top. Again, we're going to go in through our nose and out through our nose. And let's try doing three of these together. So we're going to start by going in, 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 and out, out, all the way out, and in, 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 and out, out, all the way out. Last one, going in, and out. You can use this strategy to calm your racing thoughts. You can use this strategy to expand your lung capacity and to bring more energy into your body. You can use this to help you to fall asleep at night. You can use this before you have a difficult conversation to clear your thoughts so that you can think clearly and be in the moment. One of the easiest strategies for us to use. Now, some of you may have become a little bit lightheaded. That's because you're not using your full lung capacity. And when you force that much oxygen in, your body gets a little woozy. We want to make sure that we're doing this. So I actually tie this again to my email. And I tie it to whenever I'm driving anywhere because I can do this deep breathing just to expand my lung capacity, just to keep in practice. And then I can do it whenever I'm in a stressful situation. Let's see. Good. I like some of the strategies in here. Hugging your pets. Hugging your pets, absolutely an easy beneficial strategy. But I think if you can hug your pets and doing your deep breathing, you know, petting them at the same time, bonus to both of them. Good. It is about recovery. You know, some of these things buffer ourselves prior to. Some of these things are about recovering from. And I love, you know, that kind of that that image of the art of recovery because these micro practices, they can keep us healthy, they can buffer us, but we can also use them in the middle of a stressful time to come down, to come back to normal, to get rid of that stress. You know, professional athletes know that they have to be able to have some downtime in order to be able to do the very best that they can. And so what are some of those practices? For me, it is about getting outside. I love my gardens. I love, you know, spring and summer and the colors of fall. I'm not overly keen on winter. I find winter cold. I'm, I was not set up for this kind of stuff. Uh, so for me, I have a hard time getting outside in the winter. I will find almost any excuse. I know that that is so bad for my health because we have a long winter, but I have to find other strategies. So for me, I, you know, I, it's not about making myself feel guilty. I know knowing myself well enough to know what strategies are going to work. But I love this time of year. I love just the energy around it. So getting outside, protecting ourselves. We know that daylight helps to uh, uh, impacts our hormones and our neurotransmitters, which help us to fall asleep, get a better sleep, and also to give us energy to think clearly. So making sure that we take a light break throughout the day. Now, I love the fact that some of you had talked about, you know, easy strategies being stretching or your micro practices were around stretching. Absolutely. So we're going to do a couple of these together as well. Uh, we'll do neck and shoulders. Uh, again, easy for us to do. Many of you talked about feeling it in neck and shoulders. And because you can only see me from the kind of the, the chest up, that makes it easy for me to, to kind of show you the different strategies. So we are going to, if you're standing, I want you to stand with your feet shoulder width apart, your knees slightly bent, and arms hanging comfortably with your shoulders relaxed. If you're sitting, try to get everything off your lap or in front of you, set back from your desk a little bit just so that you've got some room. We're going to work on neck and shoulders. If you have any kind of neck and shoulder issues, do only what you can. Don't push yourself further because we don't want anybody to end up hurting themselves. So very simply, what I want you to do is to look over your right shoulder. So you're going to take your chin over your right shoulder. Keep your shoulders relaxed. 
nice and loose, looking over as far as you can. And back to the center. Now what I want you to do is to look over your left shoulder. Again, keep your shoulders relaxed. And try to see behind yourself as far as you can. And back to the center. Now, we can twist and turn to get things to relax and to release. We can also stretch them to get them to release. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our ear and drop it down to our right shoulder. It's our ear that comes down, not your shoulder that comes up. So nice and relaxed, nice and level, right ear to right shoulder. Arms hanging comfortably at your side. Use that weight to pull your shoulders down, stretching your right, you know, as far as you can, ear down to your shoulder. Good. Back up to the center, left ear to left shoulder. Shoulders nice and relaxed. Keep them level. Ear that comes down. and back up to the center. Some of you might feel that that's tight, that's stiff. You don't necessarily have that movement anymore. Again, stretching several times throughout the day just to keep those nice and long and flexible. And then whenever you feel anything tightening up, tensing up, to stretch it out. Now, not only can you stretch to get things to relax, but you can also squeeze them really tight to get them to relax. So we're going to do this one as well. What we're going to do is we're going to clench. We're going to pull our shoulders up to our ears and you're going to clench until I say stop. So bringing your shoulders up, squeeze, 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 squeeze harder, squeeze it in. And relax. <sighs> Bring them up, squeeze, 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 harder, 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 squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. And let them go. And there's that <sighs> afterwards. Right ear to right shoulder. Just stretch that out again. And back up. Left ear to left shoulder. And back up. You can feel that. You can stretch that. You, again, several times throughout the day, five to ten of those stretches or squeezes just to get things to relax. But you can do that anywhere in your body. You can do it for your face if you get headaches or clenching in your jaw. You can do it for your shoulders, your upper back, your hips, your legs, your wrists, all kinds of things. So look for where you hold your stress. And then instead of waiting until it hurts, find ways of relaxing that throughout the day. So some simple things, some things that we know. How you start your day matters. If you start it with energy or do you start it going, oh, here we go again. Uh, how you, you know, put energy into your body, how you move your body is really important. Have you planned out your day? So have you mapped it out and have you, have you created space in your day? Space between meetings, space to think, space to put into place these micro practices space to actually follow through on the tasks that you said you were going to do in the meetings to get your thoughts straight and to have a plan of action uh how do you wrap up your day you know do you celebrate the things that you've accomplished do you look for ways of you know giving yourself back energy and by ref by refilling the tank, I'm not talking necessarily about nutrition. I'm talking about things that give you joy and pleasure and feel connection. How do you add into that energy resource? And then how do you tie off the day? You know, do you unplug? Do you turn it off? Do you have a bedtime routine? We know that successful leaders, that successful people, the people that thrive and have energy, these are the kinds of things that they focus on. Energy management is absolutely key. Less of what you that drains your energy and more of what gives you energy. And how do you manage that throughout the day? Those are some of the strategies that help to build your resiliency. They're tools in your tool belt that help you to move forward. All right, 
we've talked about where it comes from and how it impacts us and some self-care strategies. Let's talk about support. Remember support was that, that fourth aspect of building resiliency on the Robertson Cooper model. And what we're finding out from our research is that fight and flight is not the only aspect of our stress response. It's just one little piece of our stress response. So how do we, you know, combat that? Because it can suck the life energy from us. You know, that fight and flight response is that instinct to protect ourselves, to always be aware, you know, ready to run or ready to fight. But there is a lot more to our stress response than just fight and fight. There is also this instinct to protect the tribe to protect the people around us, to be connected to community and to other people and to our colleagues, our families, our friends. That instinct to be part of a team, to be part of a group, to be connected is actually stronger than our fight and flight response. And you're thinking, really, it's stronger? But I want you to think about it. If it was only fight and flight, it would be absolutely only about protecting ourselves we wouldn't have emergency responders. We wouldn't have people who put their life on their line, their health on the line for other people. That instinct to be protective, to help others, is what makes us a community, which it, it, it buffers us as a society. And so we reach out and we find ways of garnering that support. It's, it's not just about what we get, but it's also about what we give. When we help somebody else, when we listen to somebody else, when we help them problem solve, when we make eye contact in our meetings, when we offer our support to other people, it buffers us against all of the change and challenge that we're experiencing. This was absolutely brought home to me. Uh, I was about 12 years old and, and it was a, a great lesson to learn. I grew up in a small farming community where my neighbors were my aunts and uncles and cousins. And yes, that did make dating very difficult as a teenager. You had to be you know, asking some family history here. And so, but aunts and uncles and cousins lived all the way around and it was a great community to grow up in. I had a cousin and it was August and she was in a softball and tournament, but this wasn't just any tournament. It was the national softball championships and she was the pitcher. And so aunts and uncles and cousins, we all got together because it wasn't being held that far away. And so we drove to go and cheer her on. And I remember the atmosphere, the celebratory nature of it. And I remember playing with my cousins. I was 12 years old. I got to get away from my parents. I got to get away from my brother and I got to play with my cousins. I got to hang out with them and it was an awesome day. And I drove home with my aunt and uncle and my cousins uh, in their car. And I remember the laughter and the conversation. And then I remember how things changed. My aunt and uncle pointed out that there was smoke in the distance as we got closer to home at the end of the day. And as we got closer, it was obvious that it was coming from where we lived. And as we got closer, it was obvious that it was coming from my particular farm. Now, I wouldn't remember very much, I don't think, of that particular day. I probably even wouldn't be able to remember what the barn looked like if it wasn't for this picture that was in the newspaper. But what I absolutely do remember are the firefighters, are the neighbors, people that I had no idea who they were, that came to help out that day, that came to salvage whatever they could in that raging fire. I remember my aunts and uncles and cousins. I remember, you know, family members and, and community who, who brought food. We had food for months as they were trying to help us out. And I remember the Mennonites who came to rebuild that barn. What I remember are the people the people who supported my mom and dad in rebuilding everything that they had lost. When it comes to dealing with change and trauma and challenge, we have to rely on the people around us. Those people give us the, the resilience. They help us with perspective. They give us the support that we need to be able to take that next step. And it has been amazing to see community as we've gone through these times, how we've been able to reach out how we've been able to support each other, how we've mourned the relationships that we haven't been able to connect with, 
that we haven't been able to, you know, have that hug with that person who means so much to us. That so sense of connectedness absolutely builds our resiliency. So we need to build that. We need to build that within our teams. We need to build that within our families, within our friends, with the tools that we have available. It may not be the same, but we can still build those connections. And as we get back together and as things open up, just absolutely valuing the impact that those connections have. All right. Let's lighten it up a little bit. What do you think in the chat box? What is this a close up picture of? If you know, let me know in the chat box. What is this a close up picture of? Good, letting me know in the chat box. All right, so I'm seeing close up of dogs noses. Dogs noses, good. Uh, let's see, a lizard, coffee beans, I like that. What else? Hmm, some of you are thinking, thinking, thinking. Crocodile, oh, I like that too. Some sort of skin, that kind of roughness of the skin. My dry winter skin, oh, I so agree with you on that. Just uh, needing some, some moisture on it, okay. That's not what it is, but that could be. There you go. Elephant skin, leather. I love all of this. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, and it is absolutely the end of a dog's nose. Now, why did I put this up here, and how is this connected to what we were talking about? Because it's not just our connection to people that matter, but it can be our connection to our pets. You know, this is my oldest one. She is uh, almost 14 years old. Uh, this is Misty. Uh, I have two of them. The other border collie is is almost four years old who who torments her. But it's it's that connection to something bigger than ourselves that matters. And so it can be friends. It can be family members. It can be our colleagues. It can be our pets. It can be spirituality, whatever that looks like for you. It's that belief that you have a purpose in the world and that the world has a purpose. It's being connected to something other than ourselves, taking us outside of ourselves. That's what helps to build our resiliency. All right, we've talked a little bit about this and you know, it's it's where it comes from. How do we buffer ourselves against this building our supports? It's also about creating a life. You know, it's about that full and flourishing life. And, and what does that look like? First of all, it's about having a picture of who you want to be, who you want to grow up to be that best version of yourself. And, and not to be perfect, this is not, has nothing to do with perfection, but it is about growing into the person that you wanna be. Um, I love this, any idea what 100 equals 10 means? Any idea what 100 equals 10 means? This was a, a stat that was quoted in the Globe and Mail. Now it said, laughing 100 times a day is the equivalent of a 10 mile run. They got it slightly wrong when we look at the research. It's actually, uh, uh, oh, lots of, lots of things in here. Um, it's, it's not necessarily about the 10 mile run. It's, it was actually 10 minutes on a rowing machine. But I, I, don't, I, I think the sentiment is still there. I would much rather laugh 100 times a day for my health than I ever would to you know, be on a rowing machine for 10 minutes a day. So how are you bringing that sense of fun, that sense of adventure back into your life? You know, have you let go of that? Have you lost it? And so bringing that sense of joy and fun back in, that sense of humor. Do you have a, a humor first aid kit? I have videos and memes that just, they make me laugh. Uh, this weekend, I, I was, I had tears rolling down my face. I'm going to just add this in. I have an app. It was called Photolab. But one of the things that Photolab does is it allows you to take uh, pictures and it turns them into these characters that look like they could be on the movie Shrek. I was killing myself. I took all my friends faces and I was sending them these and they were laughing and we were talking about, you know, what kind of a character would we be if we were in a Shrek movie? But it was silly, but it was fun and it brought such joy. Uh, you know, one of one of my friends said, I haven't belly laughed like that in such a long time. Thank you. How are we bringing that belly laugh back into our life? Do we have the game face? 
you know, things are happening all around us? Or are we allowing life to happen even when we're in the middle of our meetings and not getting so serious about the perception or persona that we're trying to be? Are we allowing for fun and are we bringing, are we, what are we doing to up that fun quotient? What are you doing just to enjoy the things that are happening around you? <laughs> I love this because there was, yeah, I mean, the timing couldn't have been more perfect. All of a sudden there were all of these numbers. Somebody either hit the key or a cat stepped across the keyboard. I think that's, I think that's a better visual. I, I'm going to go with the cat. Awesome. It is about life satisfaction. And for me, life satisfaction is maximizing what we love and minimizing what we loathe. Doing more of those things that bring joy. That doesn't mean I can, I can't, I can get rid of all of the, the work stuff that I have to do, but it is making sure that I have enough of those things that just bring that sense of fun and joy back into my life. Happiness. We know this and, and we hear this all the time that it's happiness is so much more than an emotion. Sometimes we think it's, do I feel happy? But it's it's more than, you know, is it there or is it not there? It's, am I choosing to have it there? It's a choice that we make. Now, you may have seen this quote before in whatever shape, form. Um, some of us have only seen the first part of this and it says, happiness is not a destination or an end point. You know, we often talk about happiness as being a journey, but I love the second part of this quote. You know, happiness is not a destination or an end point, but it is the ability to be fully engaged in loving and caring for ourselves and for the people that we surround ourselves with. Happiness is so much more than just where we're going or just that emotion. It involves ourselves and how we take care of ourselves and how we connect with the people around us. So let's looking at, at happiness. What is the uh, number one personality trait that promotes happiness? What do you think? What is the number one personality trait that promotes happiness? Let me know in the chat box. What do you think? Thinking of personality traits. Hmm, everybody's thinking, nothing's coming up. What do you think? Positive attitude, great. Yeah, that's gonna be part of it, good. A smile, perfect. Again, our, our actions are gonna show it. Our sense of humor is gonna be part of that, good. What is the number one personality trait that promotes happiness? Uh, humor, gratitude, good. Other thoughts, what promotes happiness? Uh, let's see, I got to bend down for that one. Resilience, good. Sorry, I should have made this bigger, but I didn't uh, I didn't think to make it any bigger for the chat box. Our social skills. Oh, awesome. All right. The number one personality trait that promotes happiness is gratitude. You know, when we look at this, it's uh, you know, if we look at the top three, per, and again, personality traits, not necessarily behaviors, but personality traits, gratitude, generosity and self-care. So we look at that, you know, how we give thanks, how we recognize, how we celebrate our successes, how we document the good things that are happening. Do you have a gratitude journal? Are you praising the people around you, you know, for the things that they've accomplished, for their time, their energy? Are we acknowledging them? Are we acknowledging the good things that we bring to the table? Are we shutting down that worrying mind and looking at the, the things that we've achieved, that we've accomplished? I love this. You know, generosity is part of that. Gratitude and generosity, I think, go together because it's not only about being thankful, but it's also giving thanks and telling people that you're thankful uh, for the things that they've contributed to your life and how we take care of ourselves. So keeping that in mind, how do you bring that that attitude of gratitude to the table? This next section is really about managing our thoughts and it kind of ties in with that attitude of gratitude, but it's our thinking processes. 
And so I call this five plus because it, it kind of takes in of those resiliency traits, a whole bunch of different things. So I want you to think about, what do you think? When we talk about people who are optimistic, who are negativistic, who are pessimistic, who are apathetic, you know, if we look at the kind of four main categories of, of attitudes, what is it that optimistic people do better than the other three groups? I want you to think about that. What is it that optimistic people do better than the other three groups? It's an interesting question because it helps them to be more resilient. What are we seeing here? Bouncing back. That's going to be part of it, but there's something that they actually do that makes them able to bounce back. They are better at going from problem identification into problem solving. They're able to do that better and faster. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't get mad, they don't get angry, they don't stomp, scream, and shout, because I think, think sometimes in the way that we look at an optimistic person is that they don't have negative emotions, which is not true. Optimistic people still get mad, angry, stomp, scream, and shout, but they don't stay there. They move from what is it to what am I going to do about it faster than the other three groups. And so if we're looking at how do we make ourselves more optimistic, it's not by plastering a smile on our face, but it's by moving ourselves forward into problem solving. Now, Dr. Ellis, when we talk about thinking strategies, how do we move ourselves forward? Some of the things that get us stuck are our, our beliefs, our beliefs about the world. They can help us, but they can also hinder us. And so I like this one. One of his irrational or unreasonable beliefs says, I must have the love and approval from everybody around us. How many of you know that not everybody's going to like you, let alone love you? Now, this is an interesting one because at the head level, we know not everyone's going to like us, but at the heart level, oh, we try so hard. We say yes to things we shouldn't say yes to. Any of you, the uh, yes people? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can volunteer for that. Yeah, I can take on this project. And so we say yes because we don't want to let somebody down. Next one on his list is, I must be absolutely perfect in everything that I do. Any of you living with the superhuman syndrome? You hold yourself up to this incredible standard that you can't possibly match. And then you berate yourself for not living up to that standard. The idea that we only react in a situation, that we have no choice, again, Things may happen very quickly. We do have reactions, but we don't have to stay there. Sometimes we can't change the reaction, but what we can do is we can change how long we stay in that reaction. Another one of his, out of the, the 10 ir irrational or unreasonable beliefs that Dr. Ellis has uh, that I like is the last one. And his last one says, if I was on this endless vacation, my life would be perfect. If all of this stuff would just stop happening, I would have the best life. If everybody just thought the way that I did, we wouldn't be having these problems. Now we know that that's not true. And we know that being on a, a vacation forever is not the way to go either. We need challenge. We need change. We need some of these things happening. We need maybe sometimes a little less of these things. We want moments of calm and you know getting rid of the chaos but we don't want it all to go away. That's what keeps us motivated and energized and excited about what we're learning. And so just you know, looking at the way that you think about the world, the way that you see things, are you wishing things away? Or are you actually moving from what is it to what am I gonna do about it? Are you bogged down by negativity? Or are you looking for the positive things that are happening? Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I put together this infographic on control and it actually went viral. It went around the world. I had people from all over the world commenting and, and asking about this and asking if they could share it. You can absolutely share it. Uh, if you want this infographic, very easy thing to do is to take your phone, uh, put it on the, uh, the camera mode. You just have to kind of click the camera mode, hold it up to the QR code, and it will automatically take you to where that is posted on LinkedIn. 
you can comment on it, you can like it, you can thumbs up it, you can share it and post it and repost it, you can print it off and talk about it within your team, within your family members. But what we see is that, you know, one of the things that eats away at our resiliency is that we get so focused in on the things that we can't control and we don't take that step forward. We can't control what's happening in the government and in society and other people's reactions to things. We can control our reactions and how long we stay there. We can control what we focus our time and energy on. We can focus whether or not we hang out with difficult people or negative people or we don't, or how we take care of ourselves or we don't. And so part of our resiliency is knowing where to put your time and your energy. Our personality can help us or it can hinder us. It can build our resiliency or it can erode it and take it away. Are you a workaholic? Do you get a thrill from continually working? Do you have that drive to always be on? Are you an adrenaline rushy, uh, an, a, an adrenaline junkie from the rush of that constant, you know, bombardment of stress? We need to ask those questions and we need to answer them honestly. Sometimes it feels foreign to be able to relax. It feels uncomfortable. We don't know what to do with that, that feeling. So we fill it with either work or food or distraction. Last one, as we come to the end of our time together, the last one out of those 10 traits is around strategic hope. Now, Strategic hope sounds a little bit funny. It's not whimsical hope like, you know, unicorns and rainbows as you blow out the, the candles on your birthday cake. Strategic hope gives focus. You know, when we look in our research, out of all of the different characteristics, uh, character strengths that in their ability to predict our resilience in the face of trauma and challenge and change, hope was the biggest predictor. And so thinking about that, what does that look like for you? Do you have hope? Are you feeling hopeless? Or are you feeling with that sense of, I got this. I know it's, that it's going to be okay. I love this quote. Desmond Tutu says, hope is being able to see the light despite all of the darkness around us. I love that. I think that is a absolute epitome of strategic hope. We may not know what the path looks like. We don't know what the next steps are going to be. We don't even know what tomorrow, what we're going to be working on tomorrow in some cases. But hope is knowing that you have the skills and the resiliency and the ability to take that next step to get to where you want to be. The path may be different. Path may not be what you thought it was going to be. So you're flexible. You're able to move in that direction. It's more than just being happy. It's more than just being optimistic. It's about having a picture of where you want to go and allowing the ability to be flexible and adaptable and many different ways of actually getting there. That's what strategic hope is all about. For me, it stands for hold on, possibility exists. If I wait a bit longer, the answer is going to show itself. I'm going to be able to keep taking steps to get to where I need to be. More than a year ago, it was probably in February when this video was released. I'd been thinking about this concept of strategic hope and I put together this video. If you want to see more, again, very easy to do. Hold your phone up on camera mode and it will take you right there. Or uh, just type my name into YouTube and you'll, you're likely to come up with this particular video. Let me, again, if you like it, give me the thumbs up, show me some love or share it, share it out on your social media, share it out on LinkedIn or, or Twitter or Facebook or wherever you have your, yourself and share that message with people. Cause I think right now that sense of burnout and frustration and hopelessness is huge. And we need to be able to shine that light. We need to be that beacon of hope for the people around us. So those resiliency traits, where is it coming from? How is it impacting us? How are we going to put these strategies in place that are our micro practices that give us energy, that keep us healthy? How do we change our thinking patterns so that we don't get sucked into hopelessness, into negativity? And how do we hang on to that vision of where we wanna go? Those are the things 
that build our resiliency. Now, I, it can get overwhelming. I get that. There are so many different things that we could be working on, and this is not about making sure that you are perfect and you are doing absolutely everything, but it is about figuring out what's gonna work for you. And so I use what I call the SOS principle. And SOS stands for these three buckets of resiliency strategies. Anything and everything that you can think of in ways of coping falls into one of these three buckets. Situation, how are you gonna deal with the situation? Those are skills like problem solving and, and to-do lists and organizing and simplifying and delegating. Anything that you can do that helps you to manage the situation, the thing that's causing your stress, the frustration. Maybe it's the challenge or change that you're going through. The O is the bucket that is around ourself. The O is two parts. How am I keeping myself healthy, eating right, sleeping right, exercising? The O is also about what am I doing for balance? What am I doing for fun? What am I doing to get my mind off of the things that are causing my stress? They don't do anything about the source of stress, but what they do is they give you that energy that you need in order to be able to take the next step. And then the last S stands for support. Who do you talk to? Who do you vent to? Who do you ask for help from? Who's been there? Who's done that? Who can you learn from? Pets come into this category. Spirituality comes into this category your colleagues, your friends, your family members. It's that ability to give and garner support. And those three buckets have three questions. What am I gonna do about it? How am I gonna take care of myself? And who's there to support me? And when I can answer those three questions, I'm gonna be in a much better position to be able to manage my stress, to build my resiliency. Now, you have a handout. It was, uh, it was either sent to you or you can find it on, on Teams. Uh, it's a PDF. It has all kinds of articles in it that uh, were related to some of the topics. And you'll also see where the slides were included in the middle of it. And at the end of it, there is some information around this SOS. When you put your plan together, answer those questions. What am I going to do about the thing that's causing my stress right now? How am I going to take care of myself? making sure that I take care of myself and give myself a break from that stress. And then who's there to support me? Who can I rely on? Who can I ask for help from? And when you can answer those three questions, you're gonna be able to develop your plan and, and absolutely build your resiliency. Again, you don't have to be perfect. It's not about doing it all and it's not about you know shining in each of these areas, but it is about putting the right plan together for you at this particular time. And what you do today may be very different than what you're gonna to do tomorrow. Maybe very different resiliency skills that you need three months from now, six months from now, a year from now. I want you to think about this. What is it that you're gonna start doing? What is it that you're gonna stop doing? And what is it that you're going to continue doing? On a piece of paper, if you have it in front of you, if you've got something to doodle on, even if you have another window open that you can type in, great or you can type it on your phone. I want you to think about how you would answer these questions. Knowing all the things that we talked about today, all of the different resiliency information that's out there, what are some of the things that you would like to start doing? Like I said, one of the things for me is I need to start making better food choices, eating for energy. That's one of the things that I wanna start doing in the next couple of months or over the next couple of months. I'm not gonna wait a couple of months. What is it that you're going to stop doing? What are some of those things that maybe are draining your energy or sucking the life energy from you? What are those things that maybe are not helping you as much as they could be? And then what are those things that you're going to continue doing? Because you've already got great tools in your tool belt. So what are those things that you want to make sure you absolutely hang on to that we don't let go of? Like I said, I let go of my karate. I let go of, you know, moving. I let go of going for walks. I need to get back to some of those things. So what is it that you're going to start doing? What is it that you're going to stop doing? What is it that you're going to continue doing? Think about that. Type them out. Write them down. You can also let me know in the chat box. You can say, I'm going to start doing this, or I'm going to stop doing this, or I'm going to continue doing this. I want to be able to see what your start, stop, and continues are. We're coming to the end of our time. If you have questions, you can type that into the chat box as well. Let me know if you've got any questions or if there's anything that you want to see more of. I'd be glad to answer those. Uh, but know that you've got resources available to you. 
And, you know, before you go, just make note of some of these resources. Within Athabasca U, you have, you know, your EAP, your employee assistance program that can help you with all kinds of stuff related to stress. Whether it's dealing with family issues or work related issues or health issues, they can help to make the right connections for you. So reach out to your employee assistance program and it is absolutely confidential for you to use. You have health and wellness resources right within the university. Uh, you know, whether it's videos or uh, uh, reports or whether it is action pieces. Again, there's a QR code there that will take you there or you can, you know, follow it through mental uh, mental.health slash index dot html again that will take you there as well so use the resources that are available you're not in this alone i have resources on my website 500 different blog posts that you can you know make use of you can go in in the blog post area and search on you know mental health on depression on resiliency strategies you can type those words in you can type in sleep and you're going to find some tips and, and strategies around that as well. If you want to listen to me, I have a podcast. It's a two morning, a two minute uh, podcast every morning on mental health days, weeks and months. Use those tips. Think about, you know, uh, what kinds of things. Uh, today is mom and pop uh, entrepreneur day. And so just supporting businesses and tips around being able to do that. I have a book that you can use as well. Again, I call it a bathroom book. It's a short read, easy. You can uh, request it as an ebook, or I can send you the soft cover. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I put out all kinds of information and tips there as well. Uh, even the podcasts, I repurpose them and I put those tips there. So if at anything at all, put, the, put it there. Carry on a conversation with me. Let me know that you like certain things. Let me know if you have questions. I'd be glad to answer them there as well. Again, there's lots of ways to, to be able to handle and find information around your resiliency. You're not in this alone. And today's presentation was just to get you started. Uh, there is no such thing as a presentation, though, without an evaluation. So you can use that QR code and that will take you to where you can fill out the evaluation form. And again, uh, that will be sent to you as well if you don't have your phone with you today. I'm going to check the uh, the. Um, uh, chat box because I see some things are coming up. Uh, I absolutely love this, Jennifer. Uh, less time on social media and you're very welcome. I'm glad that you found that, that this was helpful. Uh, lots of you saying that it was helpful. I appreciate that. Again, let me know what your start, stop and continue is. Uh, let me know if you have questions. For those of you that have to go, please fill out the survey. And, and I hope that you have an amazing rest of your morning and the rest of your day. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, one last thing I should say is that your leaders are also taking this course plus one around mental health. And if you're feeling like you're challenged in any way, you can open up to them. You can ask them about, uh, you know, what are some of the resources available or ask them to help you problem solve or to make accommodations. They're there to be able to support you and to have those supportive mental health conversations. And know that everybody is hoping that we can all move forward through this challenge and change and chaos. Thank you for your time and your attention. Again, I'm going to stick around for as long as there's questions and things popping up. Uh, and I wish you the absolute best as you move forward.